Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar on aquaculture of shellfish, mollusks, and crustaceans. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. To submit a written question, please be sure to select all panelists from the drop-down menu in WebEx chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and press enter on your keyboard. All audio lines will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Liz, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'd also like to welcome you to today's, um, our second webinar in the aquaculture series. We have two speakers today. Um, Dr. Lauren Harris is a field veterinary medical officer in Massachusetts and Rhode Island for USDA APHIS Veterinary Services, where she spends her time on the Agency Disease Management and Surveillance Program some of which include contagious equine metritis, scrapie, tuberculosis, brucellosis, and pseudorabies, avian influenza, and various diseases of farmed aquatic species. Dr. Harris is a trained foreign animal disease diagnostician and an aquaculture liaison with a focus on New England shellfish. And our second speaker is Dr. Kathleen Hartman. Dr. Hartman is the aquaculture program leader for USDA APHIS Veterinary Services. She's been with USDA um, APHIS Vet Services for over 15 years, first as an aquaculture epidemiologist and then as the aquaculture coordinator in Import-Export Services. Dr. Hartman is stationed in Ruston, Florida at the University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. And with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Dr. Harris. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, as Liz mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about shellfish and mollusks in particular, and then Kathleen's going to follow up with some information on crustaceans, and then we'll take questions um, after that. So I wanted to point out um, when I saw the list of folks who had signed up to attend this, um, a lot of you are from landlocked areas and states that, um, you know, aren't participating in too much shellfish activity and farming. But I wanted to just point out that some of these hot topics, I call them in shellfish, if you read this list here, are things that you are very familiar with. So these issues that we're dealing with in shellfish, like um, animal movement and traceability and uh, emerging and foreign animal diseases, biosecurity, these are all issues that are not unique to shellfish. So even though this might seem like a very foreign topic to some of you, um, you have the skills and knowledge to deal with a lot of these issues. Um, and I hope you feel a little more comfortable with this as I talk to you today about some more common farming practices and issues in this industry. I also wanted to point out that um, I don't, I've lost track of how many times folks within veterinary services have said, oh, you work with oysters and clams? I didn't even know we did anything with oysters and clams. Well, APHIS is the lead authority for farmed aquatic health. And I just wanted to remind folks that there is a place for all of you and us in dealing with these issues. It's in our CFR. Uh, more recently, President Trump signed an executive order this past May, promoting American um, aquaculture and seafood competitiveness. So there's more coming down the pipeline with our involvement. Uh, and I also wanted to point out that there are many agencies involved in aquaculture, and some of the big, big players are these other federal agencies, NOAA, FDA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, um, and then there's also state and regional authorities. And part of this executive order is um, we will be gaining more clarification on specific agency rules. So you're all here to talk about shellfish, but well, what defines shellfish? Um, so shellfish have an exoskeleton, so they have the shell on the outside of their body, and we kind of divide them into different classes. And I'm going to be talking to you today about mollusks, so that's a class of a shellfish that is characterized by soft, unsegmented body, and they have a calcium carbonate shell. So I, actually, that's a, a phylum, and the class is bivalve. So I will be 
I sometimes use the term mollusks and bivalves interchangeably, but they're not. Bivalves um, particularly have a hinged two-part shell, and they are oysters, clams, mussels, scallops. They are mollusks, but more specifically, the class is bivalves. Kathleen's going to talk to you about crustaceans, so those where the shell on the outside of the body is well, but it's made of chitin instead of calcium carbonate. And um, they have modified appendages, antennae, body segments, and those include species like shrimp, lobster, crabs, crayfish. And also considered um, shellfish are sea urchins, and I just wanted to, you know, mention them. I'm not going to be talking about them specifically, but those are farms. Um, uh, they're eaten as sushi. Their eggs or roe are used um, in sushi as well. Um, they're kind of a delicacy. So those are farms. Um, they're not quite as widespread as some of the other species that I'm going to be focusing on. So which species am I going to talk about? Well, the top three players when it comes to market value are oysters, clams, and mussels. So I'll be spending most of my time discussing those. And when we're talking oysters, specifically, I'm mostly talking about the eastern oyster in terms of the east coast farm species. And on the west coast, it's primarily the Pacific oyster. They do farm some other species of oysters, particularly on the west coast, like a Japanese oyster called a Kumamoto. In the Pacific Northwest, they farm Olympia oysters. Um, but overall, this oyster industry is marketed or valued at $192 million, so it's really big business. And when you look at agricultural commodities where I live in the Northeast, um, these commodities, shellfish, are at the top. They bring in more money, employ more people than um, land-based uh, animals. So the other big important player here are clams. And um, I will mostly be focusing on hard clams. And this species of clams is farmed throughout the entire East Coast. In my region, we call them cohogs. I think that's more of a, a local term, but I use those terms interchangeably, hard clams and cohogs. There are other species of clams farmed on both coasts. Uh, on the West Coast, they farm manila clams. Gooey ducks, which are pictured on the lower left there, they're those giant clams with a huge siphon. They are exported internationally. They're eaten somewhat more locally, and they are really a high-value animal. They can fetch $100 per pound, so it's really amazing. Um, we farm some other species on the East Coast, too. i talk about that more in the, the next slide, but... This is, you know, $138 million industry for clams. It's really big business. On the lower right is an eastern oyster, and this is kind of like a great example of a top-shelf um, oyster bar oyster with uh, a clean shell and kind of a C-shaped uh, deep cup and kind of a bit of a fan shape. This is really what the oyster growers are striving for. This is what they're going to get top dollar for is this oyster bar product. So other species worth mentioning, so mussels would be in third place when you look at economic value behind oysters and clams. Um, there's other species of oysters, a European flat oyster. We have some folks farming those in New England. Soft shell clams, surf clams, razor clams is another variety. Uh, sea scallops, of course the gooey ducks. And if you look at the lower left, you have that really pretty kind of reddish shell creature and it is called abalone, and it's a type of giant snail. And those are also considered a culinary delicacy as well and can fetch like over $50 a pound. We don't really farm those on the East Coast that I know of, but there are definitely several facilities out west in California that farm abalone. And when we talk about mussels, it's primarily the blue mussel that we are farming. So anatomy of an oyster. My goal is next time you shuck an oyster and you're about to eat it, you take a moment and you try to identify some of these different organs. Um, actually, it's a little bit hard because once you – it's difficult. Once you shuck the oyster, they kind of are immersed in the seawater that's contained inside them, and it's not really 
3D like this picture. But this is just to remind you that they are animals and they have these organized systems of particular interest when we're talking about diseases um, because oysters and mollusks are filter feeders. They filter the seawater through their gills. So we pay particular attention to the gills, and that's often a targeted tissue for testing, as well as their GI tract, their digestive gland, kind of their rudimentary um, GI tract. So it's all there, it's just uh, different. Okay. So where are shellfish farms? Well, pretty much anywhere there is a coast. So East Coast, West Coast, Gulf Coast, um, we're farming shellfish everywhere, and it's a growing, quickly growing industry. I also wanted to mention how environmentally helpful shellfish can be to ecosystems. So I mentioned that they're filter feeders, and one adult oyster can filter about 50 gallons of water, of seawater a day. And they have this really cool process where they can convert nitrogen sources that come from harmful sources like um, fertilizer runoff or wastewater treatment facilities, um, agricultural waste, and they can take that more harmful to the environment form of nitrogen and they can convert it to a nitrogen gas which is released into the atmosphere which is in a non-harmful form. And as we know, most of the atmosphere is composed of nitrogen gas. They can also take some of that nitrogen and assimilate it into shell growth and also into the, um, the meat or the soft tissue growth as well. So oysters and all bivalves actually leave the water cleaner. It's a really cool phenomenon, and for this reason, they're used for um, they're, they're used to help mitigate the effects of pollution in some areas and restore uh, reefs and um, you know, parts of the coastal ecosystem. So to harp on the economic importance, these figures are from 2017, because that's what the 2018 um, census reflects. The sale of mollusks increased from 34 per, increased. 34% over a four-year period. That's a pretty astronomical increase. And speaking uh, from local experience, I can say that um, our New England states are reporting increases in um, shellfish, and we're talking about market value, people employed, acreage farms. Um, they're reporting increases of about 10%, eight to 11% a year, and that's been consecutive for at least the last five or six years. So this is a hugely exploding industry. Um, and I also wanna say that the figures we have are largely um, underestimating this value because especially the NAS census, for instance, that requires farmers to complete a survey and submit it. And we always know that we don't have 100% compliance when we're relying on people to do that. So our values are probably underestimating, um, you know, aquaculture numbers. Farm sizes um, can vary greatly. I will say in um, New England, the average small, the average farm size in southern New England is two acres. So that's average. Um, I'll talk more about 200 acres, but in general, we're two to eight acres. Anything over five acres is considered a pretty big farm. Um, and if you want more specifics on what's farmed in your area, I think a great resource is your local state shellfish regulatory authority. Um, they have a little bit more up-to-date information than the NAS census, which is every four years. So. so I'm going to walk you through from cradle to grave, um, the life cycle of an oyster. And every, it, it starts, and this is the same for clams, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about mussels too, but this starts from the hatchery. So commercial growers or farmers, they are purchasing oyster seed, we call it, like baby oysters um, from the hatchery. So what happens in a commercial hatchery? Well, they have oysters that are spawned uh, in-house and they, are grown in these tanks and fed algal broth 
It takes about two and a half weeks before the oysters settle down on a piece of um, calcium carbonate or crushed up oyster shell. And shortly thereafter, they're big enough that they start eating the hatchery out of house and home. So they're kicked out at about the size of two millimeters to a nursery type facility. And I'll talk more about that. And then finally, for their final grow out to market size, um, farmers use a, a variety of different grow out systems and we're gonna talk more specifically about that. So, um, and harvest time really, how long does it take before they reach harvest size? It varies a lot depending on the, the site and the region. Um, 18 months around here is at the shorter end. It can take up to three years too. Okay. So at the hatchery, I just kind of um, mentioned that we, this is where it all starts. So you start with brood stock and they eat um, a type of microalgae, which is actually grown up and cultured in the hatchery. So they can start, you can buy a commercially available inoculum and then kind of grow it in the hatchery. And a large part of the hatchery, there's a small picture at the top of this slide, it ends up looking more like a brewery than a place that you're growing animals. But there are different varieties of algae that are appropriate for oysters and clams at various stages of life. And this is a hugely technical component. Um, so this isn't like a, something a hobbyist jumps into, but they start off in these small Erlen, Erlenmeyer flasks. I've seen folks use whiskey bottles, and then they kind of move them um, to like five-gallon carboys, and then these K-tubes, they're called, these call wall tubes that are about five feet tall, these plastic cylinders. And the algae at this stage, once it reaches a certain density, is ready to be fed to these baby oysters. So this is very technical and requires a lot of skill just to run that part of the hatchery. Now we're in the hatchery, we have to select brood stock and the way you select brood stock is there's a various factors, but oftentimes um, brood stock is selected locally from animals that we know are living in the wild and they've lived in these sustained, these populations and areas where we have oyster disease. And the thought is you're selecting individuals that have some kind of tolerance to local pathogens. You can also purchase disease resistant, which is more, more like disease tolerant lines of oysters that have been developed in labs um, specifically to show tolerance for diseases. So you kind of have to know what diseases of concern are in your area and select your brood stock appropriately. You, a cool fact about um, oysters is they're sequential hermaphrodites, which means they can change their sex depending on, um, you know, throughout their lives. So in the hatchery, you can have your brood stock. You can't really tell if it's a male or female um, until you shuck it, and then you can look at the either egg or sperm under a microscope and determine what it is. So for spawning, their broadcast spawners in the wild, um, increases in water temperature, cause them to release their egg and sperm. That's the low, lower left picture. So in the hatchery, they either thermally shock them, so they try to mimic mother nature and they'll raise the water temperature sequentially within a 24 hour period of time. And um, they'll release their egg and sperm that way, or they'll strip spawn them, which is they shuck them and they just scrape out the egg and sperm. So fertilization takes place in a you know a small flask, nothing fancy, and then they're fed. The the free floating larval forms are grown in various sized tanks, and they're fed these um, algal broths, these algal concoctions, as they grow. So this is happening for the first. Um, two and a half weeks or so, and then at that point, they're ready to set. So oysters find a, a tiny crunched up piece of shell, and they convert from this free, free swimming, this larval stage to, um, they undergo a, a huge body composition change, and they grow kind of like a foot and attach it to a piece of ground up oyster shell, which they make in the hatchery, and then they stick with that shell for the rest of their life, and they build a shell matrix around that. 
So to encourage that process in the hatchery, you might hear the term downweller, and this is a system where we have directed water flow. So it's coming in from the left-hand side, and it's actually directed down, and you have these baby oysters with little bits of shell or culch at the bottom here, and there's a screen at the bottom of that plastic cylinder, and it will encourage the larvae to set on the shell, and then the water escapes on the right-hand side. So that's a picture of what it looks like in the hatchery on the right, an upboiler system. So once they get, shortly after they set, um, you know, their body size doubles at least in a 24-hour period, and it's, you know, a month-ish or so, and they're ready to be kicked out because you just can't feed them enough algae. So it's time for Mother Nature to take over. And they leave the hatchery with a health certificate. So the, the certificate should have diseases of concern for that area. And I wanted to just point out the risks at this life stage. So the hatchery is a very controlled environment, but you still have to consider your brood stock sources. Were they quarantined? Were they tested? The source of the food? Um, you're making the food in the hatchery. And most of the time, they pasteurize seawater and then add the algal concoctions to that. But you want to ask about the filtration and heat treatment for the water source. That's really important. So, and um, what kind of filtration are they using in here? Because these are a very vulnerable life stage. So any minor insults um, to these juveniles can, you know, wipe out your whole tank. So. Um, these are kind of questions to ask if you find yourself in a hatchery. What kind of filtration do they use? Any of these have been used. A lot of folks are not sterilizing the water. Um, ozone ha is more common in, in larger recirculating systems, not typical for your small to medium-sized hatchery. Um, what kind of heat treatment are they using? So a reminder are those pathways of risk. You kind of want to run through those in your head. So now they're in this very controlled environment, and we're, we're moving on to the nursery stage. So they're not quite ready for these grow-out methods that are you more commonly think of. There's kind of this nursery stage, and most of the folks around here use what's called an upweller. So you learned already about the downweller. The upweller is a similar principle, but the water flow, instead of going from um, top to bottom, is going from um, bottom to top. So you have this setup where the tube is coming in um, from the left, the influent, the water is entering this uh, tube which is suspended in the, um, water in an external container, and it creates this current from the bottom up, and it kind of mimics Mother Nature and what would be hiding, what would be happening in the tidal zone naturally with these baby oysters. So they're kind of moving up and down, and there's a high rate of flow because that is what is delivering the nutrients and the phytoplankton and the food they need to grow. So this is kind of a special stage. They're getting high flow, but they're pretty vulnerable. So upwellers can be built into docks. They can be alongside docks. Um, they require a power source, so they're usually, you know, in, along these coastal shoreline areas. I've seen a, cool, a couple cool solar-powered upwellers. This particular one pictured is called a FLUPSI, or Floating Upweller System, um, but there's a variety, a variety of these designs, too. So for grow-out practices, um, we can think of it in a couple ways. And my seven-year-old daughter wants to take credit for that drawing on the left, the lower left, but that is explaining um, intertidal zones and subtidal zones, which is basically where all of these shellfish are grown. And there are pros and cons to each, but the intertidal zone is, uh, you know, exposed to air twice a day, which you might think, gosh, you know, these are filter feeders. I have this question. How are you growing animals there when for a large chunk of the day they're not even, fil they're not even filtering food or eating? Well, oysters do something really cool where they kind of, after this period of being exposed to air, and by the way, all of these bivalves can survive um, in the air without water for extended periods of time, the air gape for respiration. Um, these oysters, after the tide um, comes back in, 
they'll kind of go into like a feeding frenzy and they'll like eat huge quantities more than they would if they were just completely submerged all day long. So they make up for it and it's really, a, we don't completely understand how they know to do that, but they do. So there's no loss in growth if you're growing in the intertidal zone. The subtidal zone is completely submerged at all times. And around here in densely populated areas, I'll say, you know, intertidal, um, grow out practices are not permitted as frequently because they're perceived by a lot of folks to be an eyesore. So if the gear is there and it's underneath the water and you can't see it, it doesn't bother people. But on the lower right, that's an intertidal farm. And some folks just, you know, they don't want to look at that on their shoreline or they perceive it's theirs. So Another thing about subtitle is if you're working underneath the water, you know you're going to need more equipment. You're going to need a boat. You're going to need some kind of hoist or winch to access your equipment. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. And then another way to look at where gear is distributed in the column is kind of like on a vertical axis. And this is pretty simple. It's either going to be on the sea floor or what's called bottom culture or on bottom or off bottom culture. And that's anything that's just propped up off the seafloor. So examples on the lower left, that's a tray, that's bottom culture on the seafloor. In the middle, we have a rack and bag system. I'll go into details about that in just a minute. But that's propped off the seafloor. And then on the right, propped way off the seafloor, it's actually a, a type of floating system or floating gear that someone fastens pool noodles to, with zip ties to oyster bags, and that's kind of a cool, innovative way to create a floating gear. So for these grow-out practices, uh, I would say the traditional practice is called rack and bag. So what does that mean? Well, the bag part of it is the upper right. It's a high-density plastic, and it's um, important to realize that these mesh sizes vary. So you as a farmer are going to be constantly changing the size mesh that you use as your oysters grow and you want to maximize flow all the time. So you want, you know, the largest size mesh that will contain your oysters but also keep predators out. And then what is the rack? In the lower middle photo is an example of a rebar or reinforced steel rack. And that's commonly used, but you can use other setups. I've seen PVC pipes. Um, it's uh, just something to keep them off the seafloor. And obviously, you know, you keep them off the seafloor, you get some predator protect protection, you know, fewer, fewer um, crab and starfish predation issues. So um, moving them in these bags is something that they're always doing on oyster farms. And one advantage I should mention about, um, you know, having them, well, off the seafloor, but also in the intertidal zone is when they're exposed to air, some of the organisms that we call biofouling organisms or fouling organisms, those are other sea organisms that attach themselves to your gear and the oysters or, or even clams themselves. Um, those are things like tunicates and seaweed and sea snails. Um, these kind of organisms don't grow as well exposed to air. So there are some advantages for getting them um, out of the ocean at times if you can. So here are some examples of grow out practices. We have um, an oyster cage on the upper left and an oyster cage along with um, these flip bags, which are pictured on the upper right, that have a pool noodle on the bottom that floats to the surface and when the tide comes in, they cause movement and they kind of rock the oysters and they create a deeper C-shaped cup, or a deeper cup shape, which is, you know, the high value item. So those grow out practices kind of foster that um, deeper cup development. But bottom cages are still um, commonly used. There's one in the lower left. And there's an example of floating cages um, on the lower right there. So we also have, um, there are these lantern nets that are pictured on the left that uh, folks around here have been growing scallops in or 
a little north from where I live. But you can also grow oysters in those lantern cages. They're really efficient use of space. They're, I think, a little bit difficult to access your animals because they're often kind of sewn shut. You can see that in that example. And upper right is a picture of a mussel facility. This is a typical, what we call, long line facility. And with a mussel facility, you have that horizontal line that's suspended by buoys just under the surface. And then there's 20 foot or even longer lines kind of hanging vertically. And um, that is a common system for mussel grow out. And there's a picture of some blue mussels um, on the lower right there. And I wanted to make sure that I mentioned clams here because they have um, a different uh, kind of setup where I live and it varies according to region. But one thing about clams is that they live below the sediment. So if you look at that diagram on the left, it shows a hard clam or a quahog. So a healthy clam is buried in the sediment, in the sand, and they use their siphon to filter in food and for gas exchange. So the clams are grown in the hatchery. On the upper right, there's actually some in an upweller that are pictured, baby clams. And they're planted on these plots that can be 75 feet, 100 feet long, and covered with netting, and the netting is anchored down. And those tend to be grown in the intertidal zone here. And um, in Florida, I'm told that they use these giant mesh bags they're called Florida bags, or that's what we call them here, and they tack those down to the seafloor. So also important to know that all of these practices, you're not committed to using one. A lot of times they'll um, change. They'll do flip bags for to develop that cup shape, and then they'll finish them in trays on the bottom. Um, anything is possible. They're constantly innovating. So we talked about how you grow out these animals. Um, in terms of management, you know, what do you have to do to maintain your crop? So um, golden rule is you want to hold similar sized animals together so they don't outcompete each other for food. So you're constantly you're constantly sorting, grading them by size to make sure that similar groups or cohorts are kept together and resorting them into bags. Since since flow is everything, you don't want to overstock. So you have one to one and a half gallons of biomass per bag for oysters is kind of a rule of thumb. So you're constantly resorting them by size, and the other thing that you're constantly doing as a farmer is removing the biofouling from the gear and from the animals themselves. So I mentioned biofouling, it's the accumulation of organisms on the surfaces. And it's a huge issue for farmers. And there are different ways you can tackle biofouling, um, but it largely boils down to mechanical removal. So power washing, as you can see on the lower left, is common. It's the most common, I would say. Um, in the middle, there's some folks out there on a clam flat, and they're using like a push broom to just scrub off the fouling material from the clam net. Um, on the lower right, is a picture of oyster bags. So NRCS, so it's a USDA program, has this uh, cool incentive where they'll give farmers about 20% more bags than they need for their farm. And the, the reason for this is when they're out working their farm and they see they have really badly fouled gear, instead of trying to deal with it right then and there, they can actually just swap out a fresh bag for the fouled bag, bring the fouled bag to the shoreline, and um, let it lay fallow, which is one of the best ways to get rid of those organisms, and then clean it up and bring it back to their farm. So this is a uphill battle with farmers. There are things like, you know, there are paints that are supposed to be deterrents, um, but we really don't like to use chemicals in close proximity to filter fooders that are filter feeders that end up in the food chain that people are eating. So we really rely on these mechanical ways. You can use things like brine dips, um, acetic acid dips, even lime, depending on which fouling organism you're trying to tackle. I know a lot of folks around here use hot water for 
um, Cleona boring sponge. So, but the toolbox is still somewhat limited. And uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is tumbling oysters. So I talked about some of those flip bags that create that, encourage the, the cup-shaped growth by swaying. Well, um, another thing that farmers do to maintain their crop is to tumble them. And the lower right is this um, apparatus that spins around kind of like a clothing dryer. And you'll put an oyster through there and like a rock tumbler, it kind of knocks off the biofouling from the shell and kind of, you know, almost like polishes the oyster. But the other important thing it does is it knocks off what's called the leading edge. So on the lower left, um, you can see that I have an oyster there. I took this picture. And the lower shell growth extends beyond the top shell growth. So the pink chopstick is pointing to the lower shell, and that's the leading edge. So when you put it through these tumblers, or even some of the gear will do this naturally in the water column, is it will chip off that leading edge. And instead of going in this elongated shape, which is depicted in wild oysters in that middle photo, um, it kind of encourages the deeper cup development. So, um, and that's just a reminder what an Eastern wild oyster looks like. They, they grow on reefs in clumps and it's not a product that you want to, you know, eat or consume at a wild bar. So now it's time for market. Um, top shell oysters, like I said, are about three inches in length. Um, they can fetch, I got this data from Massachusetts last year, 68 cents per piece. And if you have a two-acre farm, you can grow a million oysters. So it can be a pretty lucrative profession. Um, you know, years ago when I took a shellfish course, they, would, they said the average two-acre farm would, would net about $70,000, $75,000 a year. So you can sustain a family on a two-acre farm. Um, you can harvest all year round. You try to overwinter your gear and animals in locations that aren't heavily impacted by ice, but sometimes you just get unlucky. So lower left picture is one of the local farms where they had to break ice every day that winter just to maintain access to the crop. Um, there's, and with hard clams, I wanted to mention that you may have heard of them as uh, little neck clams or top necks or cherry stone or even chowder clams. These are all the same species of clam. They're just marketed at different sizes. So that chart on the lower right explains the cutoff values. Um, so back to this idea of, wow, you know, if you can have a million acres on two, a million animals on a two acre farm, who has these 200 acre plots? What is going on? So, there's a, a lot of states that still practice this kind of farming called um, bottom culture, where um, folks are crunching up oyster shell, and once they crunch it up, it's called cult, and they spread this cult over these enormous lease plots that are up to 200 acres in size. And they recruit wild larvae um, onto these sites, and oysters grow that way. So you end up with a different product. It looks more like an a wild oyster, and they're often harvested with dredging. Um, it's really difficult to get permitted in uh, my area to, to farm this way. These are historical leases. Some of them are 150, 200 years old where I live. So it's not, I would say, the wave of the future for oyster farming, but I know um, New Jersey has um, some large lease sites like this, and Connecticut, too, it's really common. And this is also the same principle that mussel farmers use. They recruit wild larvae onto like frayed ropes that they attach themselves to. So they're not getting their seeds from the hatchery. And I wanted to give a shout out to um, this concept, integrated multitrophic aquaculture, also called IMTA. Um, I, heard a, I heard someone call it 3D farming, because I think it helps visualize the concept better. But basically, you're growing different species together in a complementary way. So um, 
We always encourage diversification with shellfish farmers. If you have all your eggs in one basket, like oysters or clams, and there's a disease outbreak or a storm event, you can lose everything. So diversification um, decreases your risk, and it also can be beneficial to your crop. So an example is if you farm sugar kelp, so this macroalgae above muscle long lines, it can help protect, protect you from um, losing muscles from diving ducks like eider because um, you have this protection of kelp above it. And as kelp grows, it kind of sheds little bits and fragments that can be used um, to feed mussels. So it's a mutually beneficial system. And I wanted to throw out this idea of, you know, this concept or word triploid. What does this mean? Um, it's kind of the equivalent to a seedless watermelon or seedless grape in the oyster world. So. So we have cross. We have a cross between a tetra, tetraploid male, so four sets of chromosomes, with a diploid male, female, which is two sets of chromosomes, and you make offspring that has that's triploid, which is three sets of chromosomes. And the triploid offspring are sterile; they can't reproduce. So what's the big deal? Why do people produce these animals, and why do they sell them for a premium? Well. It turns out that oysters like to spawn in the warmer summer months, which is when most people like to consume them. And when they spawn just prior to it, they put all of their energy into gonad development. And it can actually leave the oyster kind of have, with a thin and more watery meat, and it's not really a um, highly desirable product. So if you have these triploids, you can see the one on the left has more glycogen and fat deposits. It's a little meatier. Um, they don't spawn out in the summer. They maintain this kind of more meaty tissue. And a quick shout out to ADT and shellfish. I challenge you to find another livestock commodity that has better traceability. From the minute harvesters pull the shellfish out of the water, they have to tag them. There are, um, when they're sold through the market, they have these traceable numbers that can link the shellfish back to the farm and the exact site of where they were harvested from. And these harvesting and hygiene were all, all enforced by the state and set in place through a federal state cooperative through the National uh, Shellfish Sanitation Program. So um, the FDA is involved here because of the ultimate fact is that these shellfish are for human consumption. And shellfish can carry um, a couple of pathogens um, that we really worry about, Vibrio in particular. And there are many species of Vibrio, but the two that impact human health significantly are listed here. Vibrio parahemolyticus, which can cause like a usually self-limiting gastroenteritis in people. And it in infects up to 45,000 people a year. Um, and then it's cousin, Vibrio vulnificus, which is more serious life-threatening illness. There's actually the mortality rate with Vibrio vulnificus is around 50%. So this tends to proliferate um, Vibrios in the warmer months, and we have very strict guidelines for harvesting shellfish and getting them down to a cool temperature um, immediately. And farmers and shippers have to maintain a time and temperature log um, for these animals. So I mentioned some of the regulators, but I, I want to focus, um, aside from these federal players, that regional and state authorities play a huge role. Where I live, there are shellfish constables. So there are over 50 appointed shellfish constables who enforce the um, ISSC, the shellfish um, hygiene and harvesting practices. They also um, make sure that your crop is not stolen. They patrol the waters. So there is a black market for shellfish, um, unfortunately, but luckily we don't hear too often about problems with theft. But there are some other challenges, pathogens being one of them. 
I'm gonna talk in more detail about those shortly. Um, predation, I already mentioned human predation, fouling, we talked about biofouling, weather, you can see on the upper right, there's an enormous iceberg. Um, it's gonna trash your gear. There's no filtration going on if you have 20 inches of ice around your animals. And to expound a little bit on weather, I wanted to just mention um, climate change in general. So not only are we seeing more of these extreme weather events, um, but the concentration of CO2 has increased in the atmosphere. Um, this has been happening since the Industrial Revolution, but it's increasing at a faster rate. And the ocean ends up absorbing about 30% of the CO2 in the atmosphere. So when CO2 is absorbed by the sea, a series of chemical reactions occurs, resulting in the increase of hydrogen ions in seawater. So the seawater becomes more acidic, and it causes carbonate ions to be less abundant. And we talked about carbonate because calcium carbonate is the building blocks of the shell. So these carbonate ions are, are not as readily available. So when oysters are forming their shells, particularly, and it's all shellfish, it's not just oysters, in this very small early juvenile stages, um, their shell just becomes malformed. It's thin and brittle, and they're more subject to predation. So shellfish are really sensitive to these um, acidic environmental changes. And some folks predict that if we don't do something about the levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, that our shellfish populations could decrease by 25% in the next 40 or 50 years, which is really scary to think about. And we need those filter feeders to help keep these ecosystems healthy. Along with those weather events, we with increasing in, uh, increasing temperatures, we see or have been seeing more harmful algal blooms. And algal blooms may not kill the oyster themselves, but um, they can produce toxins that can make people sick who consume them. They can also um, consume all of this dissolved oxygen in the water, and that does not create a good environment for growth for oysters. So. We have these challenges. We've got these environmental conditions. You know, we have predation. We have um, pests and predators, crabs, starfish, snails, sea sponges. Um, we're still innovating our farming practices and containment systems. We have a lot of challenges, uh, a lot of regulatory red tape just to get permitted. Um, farmers have complained about the availability of crop insurance, that it's not as readily available to them um, as land-based farmers. Um, pollution, and I took a, a shellfish farming class where my teacher would say, statistically, you need to expect disaster every nine years where you're gonna lose everything, which is a scary thought, but this year, um, you could say that that disaster was COVID. So we. I mentioned that everyone wants this top shelf oyster bar product. Well, all the oyster bars have been shut down with COVID. So the oystermen and shellfish farmers in general have taken a hit, although those who are growing clams are a little more insulated. So we are vet services. I'm gonna talk more about pathogens and mention the OIE pathogens affecting these shellfish. But how could you even tell by looking um, at a shellfish species which is healthy and which are sick? So in general, healthy animals just have more meaty rope. You can see these fat glycogen stores. It's just a meatier animal. Sick animals are just thin meat, more watery. I can't always tell the difference between a recently spawned out animal and a sick animal. So a lot of the diagnoses are, are, almost all of them are gonna be, you know, involving the lab with the molecular or microscopic diagnosis. So we have all different, you know, a variety of pathogens affecting shellfish, protozoa, bacteria, viruses. Um, depending on your region, you have different pathogens of concern. 
I would say if you're closer to the East Coast and you want to do a little research on a pathogen that impacts the industry greatly, I would look up this Perkinsis marinus, which is also called Dermo. That's an OIE notifiable disease of oysters. On the Pacific Coast, you might look up this emerging Ostrid herpes virus 1. So um, with Diagnostics in general in pathology, we don't have PCRs for everything. We still sometimes have to rely on histopathology. Um, so here's a snapshot of the OIE reportable diseases. Um, the upper right, that photo is the Ostrid herpes virus 1. Uh, I actually think there's one of the, so that's a heart cell of an oyster, and you can see those little, those really dark black kind of pock marks are the virus. So here is the list. I want to encourage you to expand your knowledge and explore the emerging diseases and the endemic diseases too, because those are really important to industry. Here's a list of some of those right here. Um, in general, the ones in in blue impact oysters, and the QPX and clam neoplasia are more of a clam disease in general. These also are not zoonotic, so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, catching any of these pathogens. Um, and upper right are actually pictures of these hypnospores that the organism Perkinsis marinus produces. So. That's one way to test for them is to kind of like let the oyster meat rot in the lab and you look at it after three or four days under the microscope and see these spores. So how do you control these pathogens in general? The site selection is important. You don't want a high traffic area where there might be um, vectors or people bringing in, um, you know, potential pathogens. You don't want point source pollution pouring onto your farm or nearby. You can invest in disease tolerant strains like we talked about in the hatchery using locally sourced animals or crossing locally sourced animals with these um, developed disease quote resistant strains. Um, every time these animals are moved, they in general require a health certificate. So you as a farmer would ask for these health certificates. And um, flow is everything, so make sure that you reduce stress on the animals by following appropriate guidelines for stocking densities and removing, staying on top of the biofouling on your farm. And also a reminder that there's no such thing as zero risk. And on that note, we have some pathogens like dermo in oysters, which is ubiquitous in southern New England. So it's unrealistic to think that you're going to get a negative test result if you test 30 or 60 oysters for movement. So some states, and this is an example of Rhode Island, have come up with these biosecurity zones where they'll have established prevalence for a specific pathogen, like dermo. And you can move animals from um, an area that is lightly infected to an area that is more heavily infected, but you can't vice versa, move animals from heavily infected zones to lightly infected zones. So it's kind of a different way of thinking about disease, and we know we have it, we're just trying to manage it. So the pathogen testing is costly. Who pays for this? The hatcheries themselves, if they're selling their seed commercially, um, stakeholders, extension services, um, states have surveillance programs. USDA has been able to contribute or augment ongoing surveillance um, in the New England area. And how are these pathogens spread? So wanted to take a moment to look at these historical cases of um, incidents where we had disease outbreaks in shellfish. So shucking waste is something a lot of people don't think about, but say that you live in New York and you buy some oysters from your local grocery store and you bring them to your, your ocean house in the Hamptons and you're sitting on your dock and you're chucking oysters and drinking a glass of wine, and you're just discarding the shells dockside into the local water. Well, you could have just introduced dermo from 
Rhode Island or Southern Massachusetts oysters into the local oyster population in New York. So I think there's a huge education component with this. If you have any ideas about how to spread the word that this is a possibility, um, let me know, let us know, because it's a big obstacle when we think in terms of international trade and allowing shellfish from other areas. Uh, unregulated movement without disease testing animals, that happens. Um, it's been linked to some of the herpes outbreaks, Oxford herpes virus one outbreaks in Europe. Ballast water, so this fact really just floored me. Over 3,000 marine species travel around the world in a ship's ballast water on a daily basis. And for those of you who may or may not know what the ballast water is, um, a ship can, a captain can take on more water or discharge it um, throughout the course of the journey to help kind of steady the ship in the water, but there's no regulation about discharging this water. We have nuisance species, even oysters, that can attach to ships or barnacles on ships and bring disease around the world that way, um, or other shellfish. Um, and unintentional introduction through uncooked seafood that some folks might use as bait to go fishing. And we don't always understand how these outbreaks happen, um, but a lot of them have been associated with high volume commercial shipping ports. So we know with this movement, we, we inherently have some risk. So we're still trying to explore and learn about all the different ways pathogens spread. And here's just a quick picture to show, you know, these international water, these boundaries are really somewhat arbitrary when it comes to pathogens. They're just lines, and we have some challenges in the open water environment. So now I'm going to talk about a mortality event um, on a clam farm. And it is just a scenario to help kind of guide you through some questions you might ask or things you might see if you were responding to a, a call of, as a foreign animal disease diagnostician. So it is late May, you've liaised with your state and regional regulators, shellfish regulators, so they know that they can call you, APHIS, USDA, with an unexplained mortality event, and the extension agent gives you a call to report a large die-off in hard clam. So you are preparing for your visit to the clam farm. And first I wanna just talk about the gear that you might need when you're visiting one of these farms. So most of the clam farms are in the intertidal zone. So you're going to wanna plan your visit at low tide. You're gonna to wanna to plan your visit at a time when you know you can visualize the animals. And the farmers are very aware of the tide. And you can, I have an app on my phone that just helps me if I'm visiting a farm. Um, but something to consider that you probably have never considered before when responding to an FAD and other species. So you also want to dress appropriately. So you can, if it's low tide, you can wear your, you know, Wellington type boots, but you might even need waders depending on the type of farm you're going to or water shoes. But when you arrive on the farm, you see this, you see um, the picture on the lower left. You pull up the mesh netting that protects those clams that are planted below the sediment, and it's all of these dead clams. They're just shells everywhere. And on the adjacent plot, which isn't pictured, about half the clams are dead. And then the next plot over, plot three, is healthy, which the lower right picture shows a healthy clam plot. There's no shells on the surface. And we remember with clams that when you look at this lower left diagram, they need to stay buried in the sediment. So if they are emerging on the surface, they're not well. So that's your big clue right there. It's a red flag. And honestly, you're gonna be hard pressed to find live clams on the surface because usually they're destroyed by predators pretty quickly. But as a FADD, um, we, you are looking for the moribund or sick animals. Those are high value animals to sample. You can talk to your lab, but we don't generally submit deads because they just decompose or they don't last long in these environments so quickly. So we know they're sick because they're coming up from, they're on the surface. 
And some other questions that you might want to ask are here. You know, how many have died? When did this start? The plant farmer tells you he hasn't been to this particular plot in a month because he's been farming oysters in a different location. Uh, recent movement, well, we know people can walk the beach, so we always have that potential for visitors on the farm. Um, how long has it been going on? It wasn't there a month ago, these dead clams, and some, somehow over the last month, this has been going. We don't exactly know when for the timeline. Um, where did he purchase these animals? He has records and a health certificate from the hatchery that he purchased from them. Um, and what life stages? These are juvenile two to five centimeter clam. Have there been any changes in water quality? Have there been any mandatory closures for harvest because of water quality issues? No. Any other mortality events that he knows of or she knows of? Um, maybe a few hundred yards away, they heard that there was a, uh, the clams weren't doing very well, but no other specific information. So what do you do? Um, you call the lab before you submit samples, and you have to work it out with your supervisor. You may be submitting paired samples, some to NDSL, some to a local shellfish lab. You may start with a local shellfish lab who can forward on to NDSL. So you get your plan in place, but you've got to talk to the labs that you're submitting to. Which animals do you choose? We talked about selecting moribund animals as high-value targets. Um, they'll tell you the number to submit, but what tissues do you submit? Well, luckily for you, you don't have to tissue dissect these shellfish to submit specific organ system samples. You, in general, submit the whole animal. And I've never submitted fewer than 35 animals. Um, 30 is what our local shellfish lab uses for surveillance, that number, but I always add they, pr they prefer I add at least five in case some die in transit. So you're going to communicate with the lab. That's essential. How do you transfer these samples? Well, if they're going locally, you can ask the lab. Our lab prefers them to, they're in a cooler on ice, which is exactly how they're transported if they were going to end up for human consumption. If you're transferring them to NDSL and you're overnight shipping, you're going to talk to them probably using your gel packs. So the lab performs their analysis and they reveal that they, the clams have a type of cancer called hemocytic neoplasia, also called disseminated neoplasia or hemic neoplasia. And on the left, you can see these abnormally large cells with dark nuclei. Those are the cancerous cells. That section is of the gill of the clam. On the right is a normal section of gill on the clam. So this is a type of transmissible neoplasia, like um, similar to a transmissible venereal tumor in a dog for the veterinarians out there. And um, eventually these um, irregular cancer hemocytes will just take over and kill the animal. So what do you do about it? Well, this is, we don't completely understand the transmission, but we know it's directly transmissible. If I, if I suck out some cancer cells from a diseased animal and inject them into another um, healthy clam, that clam will develop this type of neoplasia. So the extension agent believes that we that there's a net management issue contributing to this, um, where Farmers will peel that net that's protecting the clams off the farms, and they'll kind of toss it onto their adjacent plots temporarily to harvest animals. That could potentially introduce this uh, transmissible neoplasia to the next plot. So site location is important. You probably want to sacrifice that plot that has 50% mortality because it's going down. They're, they're on their way out and at least give yourself some physical space from the next healthy plot over. Um, consider fallow periods for this disease. Um, some of the animals do survive it, but it's not, it, it's not um, going to be enough to, to keep your farm running. So hopefully you have invested in more than one species and you have kelp or 
oysters and a, or you can actually consider leaving this fallow or actually moving on like intertidal oyster grow out practices to this area because oysters don't get this neoplasia. So you have some options and again, these are clams. So we talked about the fact that you can harvest clams at different sizes and you might want to consider just harvesting early um, the smaller sizes so you're not dealing with this, the rest of your animals succumbing to this disease. So in the home stretch here, um, how can you learn more about shellfish or aquaculture or what species are farmed in your particular area? Um, in general, here are some resources. The NVAP modules uh, have some good information on them. I know they're going to be revamped in the next year or so to look for some changes and maybe even a new module. Um, learn about what is grown in your state. You know, learn the practices that are common to your area. Um, a great way to do that is to attend a local conference. Um, introduce yourself to the local aquaculture regulators. Find out even who they are. Take a class. Um, take a class in person. There's all these virtual learning options now. Um, I have a link at the end of this presentation for one example of one that I know a lot of folks in our agency have taken and it's really affordable and you can take it at your own time and it's kind of, you know, basics of shellfish farming and talks about a lot of these issues that I brought up. You can also talk to national aqua staff. Everyone on aqua staff is pretty well connected. So even if they, um, you know, don't know the name of the person or the regulator in your state, they can link you up with someone who does. So they're a great resource if you're just trying to figure out where to get started. And then hold yourself accountable. So put these activities in your IDP, talk to your supervisor about them. You know, this is agriculture, this is under our purview. We should, we should be supporting you to get the training you need to respond to these, you know, an FAD for, any, for example. Okay, and uh, one more thing, there is, the, um, there is a group called the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association, and on the West Coast, it's the Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association. And you could sign up to get email alerts from that group, and that really kind of is a great way to learn about some of the issues that the farmers are, are discussing amongst themselves. And they do announce things like local learning opportunities often on that, um, those emails as well. So here are some helpful resources. You all are gonna get a copy of this PowerPoint. I duplicated a couple of these bullets, but nonetheless, they're good resources to have. The applied shellfish farming course that you can take virtually is listed at the bottom with all the contact information if you're interested for that in that. And uh, my last slide is just acknowledging that a lot of the material from this presentation came from Roger Williams University and our local Cape Cod Extension agent. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out and thank them. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen so she can talk to you more about crustaceans. Hey. Hey everybody, thank you Lauren. That was an awesome, awesome presentation and um, thank you so much. And I echo uh, everything uh, that Lauren said uh, regarding uh, continuing education and opportunities uh, to learn about the more about mollusk culture or mollusk industry. And of course the OIE manual, um, that's freely available online, has a lot of information about all, um, well, at least the OIE listed diseases that are um, present as well. And um, I made a note to also send out a link to the uh, University of Arizona as we transition over to shrimp uh, diseases and culture that they also have a great uh, education program that runs typically for a week uh, in June. Uh, so again, if that's something that excites you or you've got a lot of shrimp culture in your area, keep that in mind for your um, development plans. 
All right, so let's dive down into crustacean aquaculture here in the United States. On this um, tree that you see in front of you, the majority of the cultured animals fall under the Malacostraca um, order here, and we're primarily talking about the prawns and the shrimps. Uh, as um, Lauren indicated, some of these earlier life stages, like the algae, can um, be done in culture and are considered live feeds for many of the finfish larval stages, um, as well as uh, being food for our uh, filter feeders that way as well. So all of our um, crustaceans uh, that fall to the right of that tree are decapods. And decapods obviously means that they have uh, 10 legs, five pairs uh, at some point portion of their body or thorax area. Um, sometimes, you know, as with uh, differentiating between uh, koi carp and goldfish, there are a couple of tricks when you're out in the field to uh, look kind of cool, like you know what you're talking about, between the prawn and the shrimp. And those differences are provided to you there as well. By the way, um, koi carp have barbs. Uh, that come off like whiskers uh, off of their mandible, and uh, goldfish don't have that. So it's a really nice trick uh, if you're trying to differentiate between those two. So what's important about this decapod group is that for some of the OIE-listed pathogens, all decapods are considered susceptible to pathogens like white spot disease, uh, which is a, a virus that affects the um, cuticle or the external uh, skeleton of these creatures. So again, it's a really vast group of animals. There are about 15,000 decapod species that we know of, probably a lot more than that uh, exist in our world as we know it today, um, and we've already probably lost a few as well. Um, so again, very diverse group. Uh, and the susceptibility to some of the pathogens is very broad. With regards to um, the culture of shrimp and crayfish in the United States, let's start with shrimp. Texas by far is the number one state for shrimp uh, production in the United States, followed uh, really distant uh, to that 3.2 million pounds of production in 2017. Uh, Alabama is actually number two, and they do around 700,000 um, uh, pounds of production on an annual basis. And then, of course, you've got the states of Hawaii, Florida, and also uh, recently within the last probably mm, five to eight years, we've got indoor culture of shrimp uh, occurring up in Minnesota, which is kind of cool. Uh, most of our um, shrimp producers are a combination of indoor and outdoor culture where they've got um, early production going on uh, in the ponds, but then they also use some tank culture either to maintain their brood stock um, or collect up the animals out of the ponds and temporarily hold them in raceways or ponds um, until they're ready to ship out of the farm. Uh, many of our shrimp uh, producers in this country are very elaborate, uh, foreignly owned or foreignly based companies. We've got a number here in Florida also um, with corporate partners um, in Hawaii and Texas across the United States. These companies employ all 100% indoor culture of these animals. They as I mentioned last week in our call, they have the brood stock here in the United States. Uh, depending on, and we're going to talk about the designation of SPF status, um, they maintain these SPF-like um, populations of brood stock, grow out the early life stages, and then shrimp these PLs, which are, I don't know if you guys can see the incredibly small life stages, early life stages of these animals to foreign countries uh, for grow out. 
and then of course we buy them back as uh, seafood. Those big companies are foreignly are foreign owned companies, most of them from uh, Asia, and they have their headquarters over in Singapore, uh, and uh, have again these brood stock entities here in the United States. When you're going to the grocery store, still unfortunately, 90% of the shrimp that are consumed here in the United States are still imported, again, largely from Asia and Central America. Um, most of the shrimp that are exported from the United States are the Pacific white leg shrimp. Uh, and those, again, are those early life stages that are exported for grow out. Interestingly enough, in the United States, within probably, I guess, the last 20 to 30 years, um, we've got crayfish culture occurring as well. Um, I always used to think that crawfish or crayfish were um, wild caught, but we do see some production going on across the southeastern United States. Louisiana is the big hitter for this one um, among those states listed there with 85% of the farm-raised crayfish coming from that culture in Louisiana. There are about 1,600 farms with over 120,000 acres uh, in production. Uh, the average size of those farms are listed there. Uh, the largest, of course, then is about 150 uh, acres. They're producing between 130 and 150 million pounds per year that are all basically domestically consumed here in the United States. It's got about 172 million farm gate value, uh, so that's pretty significant, uh, and relatively few exports, most of their products being consumed here in the United States. Oops, I don't seem to have perfected this system yet. So um, just quickly, I wanted to share again, uh, Panaeus vaname, again, is the scientific name for the Pacific white leg. We do have other species and culture here in the United States. The, uh, the monodon species are another type of um, shrimp uh, species that we have to a lesser extent. Largely, uh, these species are of the vaname. Uh, you can see the life cycle there in the uh, left-hand corner where the females uh, release their egg clutch into the water. Uh, these eggs will disseminate across the surface of the tank and then eventually drop down to the lower benthic areas. Uh, and then they go through these early life stage phases of nauplii, protozoa, a mysis stage when they finally get to the post-larval stages, which are when we are actually able to then able to see these really tiny uh, specks in the water, or even if you had sea monkeys um, as a kid, uh, those again were these kind of early life stages of um, some smaller shrimp species there. Uh, you can see on the timeline that's provided there, uh, we get to the post-larval stages at about days 10 to 12 post-hatch from the egg stage. Uh, and after that, the exponential growth of these animals, like I discussed about the cobia last week, uh, is so incrementally fast over the post-larval stages that as our exporters are working to bag up these animal stages, they have to get these animals to their destination country, usually by uh, post-larval stage eight, which is about, depending on what cycle you're looking at, um, the maximum stage for export, uh, because once that stage, the metabolism and the growth rates of those animals in these confined shipping bags, uh, it becomes a welfare issue for the animals that have been packed. The additional um, pictures, the guy holding the jar, that is a scoop out of a post-larval tank. These were um, post-larval um, or post-larval stage six, and you can't even hardly see, except for maybe some cloudiness in that water. Uh, and then we took a dip net into those tanks as well, and you can see that brown mat of glop, if you will, 
Uh, and those are thousands upon thousands of um, Vaname post-larval stage six. Uh, we were collecting these animals to then send them off for testing at the diagnostic laboratory. Many of the countries where these stages are being exported to do require testing of these post-larval stages. Many of these companies will be testing both the broodstock and these PL stages um, to uh, meet export market demands, those types of things. But again, it's that time frame. If we're collecting the post-larval as say PL6, these guys have to be out the door by PL8, which is a couple of days later. So the turnaround time on these diagnostics results is really critically important, again, for these animals to be transported safely uh, in shipping bags over a couple of days. Shrimp anatomy, again, these animals will go through um, several molts throughout their um, life cycle, but their anatomy is important when we talk about being able to go out to these facilities and collect the appropriate samples for diagnostic testing or in response to a foreign animal disease. On the external anatomy diagram, the really important things to note are um, the swimmerettes or the pleopods. These are the kind of larger and more hairy legs, if you will, that are on the abdominal, abdominal segments of these animals. Uh, if uh, this is a species of uh, shrimp females that hold on to their eggs, they will use these eggs to kind of aerate and keep the, the water moving around those eggs. Um, these are also really great samples for uh, diagnostic testing. The pleopods have uh, a vascular uh, component to them, and so these, especially when we're doing non-lethal sampling of the broodstock, you can take a pleopod off of these animals. They do not grow back, so uh, there's a limited number of these, obviously, that you can take. Um, and oftentimes when you go to these um, corporate shrimp production facilities, you will see uh, females uh, in their broodstock tank that are, are essentially no pleopods left uh, because they have been sampled routinely over their lifespan, which is probably at the most three years, probably less uh, if you are a female that's been in production for a while. So. Again, sometimes you will see these animals that have um, all their pleopods have been sampled. Uh, but again, those are really nice, a non-lethal site to collect those uh, samples. Uh, internally, these animal, animals are obviously very uh, rudimentary. They uh, largely consist of digestive uh, components as well as reproductive components. And that's basically it, just to get the jobs done uh, in terms of thriving and uh, reproducing uh, that way. We can also um, take another le uh, non-lethal sample can be to take some hemolymph from these animals. That's not really typically done because of the challenge of getting that sample and getting it done cleanly that way. The pleopod is really the best uh, option there for a non-lethal sampling. Obviously, for those small life stages, it's the whole animal that gets chopped up and then all of that material is tested uh, at the laboratory. Average lifespan in production is about one and a half years, uh, three at the most uh, probably out in the wild. Shrimp, like their fish counterparts, have a great uh, feed conversion ratio of about one to one. Uh, in the production, they are, are typically in the production cycle for about 100 to 140 days. Uh, and that yields a really nice sized uh, plate sized animal. And of course, uh, depending upon the marketability and the target markets of these facilities will depend on, of course, what size uh, they are targeting uh, to specific uh, clients that these uh, facilities have. At 140 days, you're gonna have around 20 to 24 animals per pound of um, weight. Uh, there. Uh, 
You can see on the diagram on this slide, too, uh, that the, it runs through a little bit of the different uh, production cycles. Uh, the brood stock are obviously kept isolated. They are in uh, tanks that will allow the eggs to be collected off the surface of the water. Once those eggs are collected in a side hatching jar, they then move to holding tanks or um, isolated areas where these animals can then go out those early life stages. Oftentimes, the brood stock uh, will have a identification marker on one of their um, um, eye stocks, if you will. They also can uh, insert pit tags underneath the cuticle of these animals. Of course, if they're going through a molting phase, that could be lost. Typically, they just put a clip on the eye stock of these animals so that they can track uh, the males and the females uh, in these tanks and which ones have been paired uh, together uh, that way. So there is some traceability about which pairs uh, were collected, uh, which tank those were from, uh, those types of elements of animal identification that way. Here are just some pictures of some typical culture uh, in the United States. That top picture with the checkerboard is a uh, shrimp farm. Uh, and actually the picture next to it along the side is what that looks like uh, inside that facility. So it's basically a covered uh, open-ended pole barn, if you will, that has all these concrete tanks underneath it. And you can see how immense this facility uh, is. Uh, on the bottom there uh, is a facility in Texas that operates within a huge biodome. This biodome is completely uh, inside. It's completely enclosed. Um, and again, you can see how extensive these facilities can be. The picture next to that biodome is one of the raceways that is within that um, facility there. The water. Uh, for some of our shrimp producers, they use what they call a bioflock, which basically means there's a lot of bacteria and detritus that is circulating in all levels of the water column. And again, like the biofilter material that we talked about last week that has um, uh, divots or surface, multiple surfaces, areas on a small thing, Bioflock is essentially the same principle, but we are using the um, detritus in the water for those good bacteria to colonize on so that they can uh, go through the nitrification cycle. Uh, so it's effectively cleaning the water. Even though these bioflock situations look like the water's dirty, um, that you really can't see through it, that is their mechanism for keeping the water clean uh, for these animals that are living in that type of culture. The bottom picture there is one of these uh, crawfish uh, facilities out in Louisiana, really big, extensive uh, ponds there that um, can also are a lot of times do combination farming with rice fields. Uh, which is obviously also practiced uh, over in Asia a lot. Um, and so you can see that these areas are um, diverse, lots of uh, vegetation that might be uh, growing uh, in that area as well for those animals to um, run and hide in and live. Uh, the red buoys that you see out there, um, are the cages that are baited for these animals to come into, and then the farmers will either walk out there or take a vessel out there and collect up these uh, crawfish traps and collect them that way. Here's some pictures of some um, Vaname broodstock. Um, you are able to sex shrimp as early as you can begin to uh, see the adult stages of these animals. Um, up at the top picture there, you see a mature female in comparison to the bottom picture. Males are going to have um, an extra set of um, thicker 
a plea upon your legs, obviously that's so that they can hold on to the females during the uh, spawning or reproductive events. Uh, the, the opaque white tissue that's there on the right-hand side of um, the male picture on the bottom are the spermatozoa sacs, if you will, that the, um, there's a pore there where the male will squeeze that sac out and release sperm into the environment. One thing I should have um, shared with you last week as well when we talked about spawning of these animals, a lot of times, uh, particularly in the fish world, not so much in the shrimp world, um, broodstock will be given a spawning aid of either GNRH or um, some kind of a gonadotropin to um, get the females ready for that spawning event um, uh, to occur on a routine basis. Jeez, I'm sorry, y'all. I forgot kind of where I was going with that. Anyway, back to the shrimp. Uh, and then down here on the bottom, you can see uh, to get female shrimp to reproduce uh, frequently, apparently ablating one of the eye stalks is very effective at getting the females to come back into a reproductive cycle more quickly. They essentially ligate off one of those eye stalks. And so, again, when you go into these facilities, you may see some females that only have one eye. It's not because of trauma or anything else. That does just help those females come back into cycle more quickly. Uh, and obviously, uh, a lot of these guys are year-round producers um, of these animals. Here are some close-ups again, uh, and I know this might be really difficult to appreciate, but uh, in the far right-hand picture, uh, the handler there has been able to artificially extrude that sperm sac that he's holding in between his thumb and forefinger there. Again, that would be released by the male uh, fish and, I remember what I was going to say, fish and uh, sperm, sperm are activated by the seawater. So until those sperm actually hit uh, the seawater of whatever salinity turns them on, quite literally, and then you'll begin to be able to see them uh, move around and become active and uh, look for those eggs to fertilize. So what to know about shrimp aquaculture? The shrimp industry really were the first, uh, at least of the aquaculture group, um, and it's probably more in line with uh, poultry in terms of biosecurity, really ahead of the game, more so than our fish culturists, if you will. They are, have um, the HACCP, the um, Hazard Assessment Critical Control Points um, in place. Some of our bigger facilities down here in Florida have personnel that wear color-coded uh, uniforms while they're at work, and the blue people can never go where the pink people go. And um, it's a very intensive production in terms of biosecurity. Visitors are often um, very restricted, uh, as well as making sure that all the perimeters from the introduction of um, insects, other crustaceans are absolutely kept out um, that way. So really intense biosecurity. If you are planning to visit a shrimp facility, please call ahead, no surprise visits for these types of entities, typically they usually require a 48 to 72 hour grace period between you visiting uh, another shrimp facility. Also, if you've eaten shrimp the night before, they would like you not to visit. So again, just be very cognizant about um, activities leading up to these types of farm visits uh, with relative to biosecurity. The shrimp industry um, is really interesting, and I think that it goes back to these kind of very old prehistoric animals that we still don't know a great deal about their immune function, uh, disease resistance, uh, these types of things. And so it has led to practices that, from an epidemiological point of view, are going to blow your mind. Um, and there are all kinds of terms being used in this industry. Uh, 
the ones that I'm presenting here, I think represent the, at least the lingo that we see frequently and often misused um, in this country as well. But uh, just to let you know too, we've got the specific pathogen free animals. That is a designation reserved for the health status of those animals. Typically that is reserved for the broodstock. Currently the only state that has a program to designate animals as SPF is Hawaii. Hawaii has a um, state-run SPF program for their shrimp producers. Please don't ask me if I think it's a uh, valid uh, program because I don't, but I think there's a lot to learn um, and there's a lot of opportunities for APHIS perhaps to uh, work with our shrimp growers to really enhance what SPF really means. The other three categories are related to more genetic characteristics. One is specific pathogen resistance, which is SPR, which is a resistance to infection. These are animals that have been bred for specific resistance to diseases. And fortunately in the, sh the, the shrimp world, when you have resistance to one type of pathogen, for example, white spot, you often then also gain resistance to other pathogens for whatever reason. So there seems to be some uh, relationship, say, between white spot disease and IHHNV. When you are resistant to one, you also develop characteristics to be resistant to specific other pathogens as well. Resistance is uh, engineered, if you will, by exposing animals, selecting those animals that um, survive. It can also be done at the gene level. Uh, a lot of our shrimp uh, industry are geneticists by training, uh, and they employ all their different tricks uh, to develop these lines of uh, pathogen resistance. Specific pathogen tolerance, or SPT, again, is a genetic characteristic where the animals can be infected but do not show signs of clinical disease. Obviously, these animals can be very dangerous in terms of population medicine and population health. Um, it is not clearly understood if these animals are nidices for infection, that um, there is a recrudescent of these types of um, tolerant animals that they begin to shed uh, active virus or whatever uh, to their tank cohorts. Uh, I don't see this being used that much, but it's certainly a terminology that's out there. The other practice that drives me insane is all pathogen exposed, or APE. This is a practice used very commonly down in South America where the animals are exposed to multiple diseases at once, maybe one disease at a time. The animals that survive that infection, they go through the disease, they survive that infection, they are then collected back, exposed again, collected back, and exposed again. And so, again, they're trying to develop some kind of resistance. Again, the impact of that type of practice on the diagnostics, the uh, infectivity of these animals to their tank cohorts is still, I think, a very dangerous practice uh, that way. And so we do have a number of companies that uh, get their animals from APE facilities down in South America. It can be really difficult now then to interpret what some of their diagnostic tests mean because they'll come back as positive, um, but to clinically healthy animals, um, that we see on the farm. So again, just to kind of keep those in mind when you hear uh, the industry talk about those things. Issues for U.S. shrimp aquaculture. Um, last year in 2019, you all may recall that we had a really um, intense uh, outbreak of IHHNV, which is an OIE listed pathogen of shrimp. Uh, these we have had detections of IHHNV in the past that have been linked to imports from APE facilities down in South America, 
This, in 2019, we had an outbreak where we really couldn't determine where the introduction uh, came from. Uh, certainly, um, there is a significant risk of most of these uh, shrimp pathogens coming in from live animals being imported either as potential broodstock or as broodstock uh, for hybrid vigor or whatever um, that practice is, but also the risk of these pathogens coming in on seafood products that are entering into the United States. For those of you that have been around for a while and APHIS might remember the 2003 or four outbreak of white spot disease in Hawaii, that outbreak was able to be determined that the, the shrimp that we buy in the grocery stores, often animals that are positive for white spot, yellowhead, tara, which are classically the three big shrimp diseases, they don't, they're not zoonotic. Um, and again, because of the APE practices, these may be very wholesome animals for us to consume. But of course, once we discard those shells, much like in the mollusk industry, those are going to landfills or being tossed out into open waterways. Those viruses are still um, active in the cuticular material and can then uh, be released into our resources. That case in Hawaii, one of the shrimp farms was located fairly close to a um, landfill where seagulls and whatnot were picking up the discarded um, exoskeletons from human consumed products. And unfortunately, that introduction was uh, brought that way to those farms. And of course, uh, the divers then that were going each into these different ponds then spread that virus around there. Um, so again, a, a, a really significant risk to our domestic industry, which is why many of them are 100% inside and why biosecurity is so important uh, to this industry. Within the last couple of years, we've also seen serious um, diseases emerging over in Asia. We now have um, div decapod iridescent virus. Again, even from the name, you can tell that it's all decapods that are considered susceptible to that virus. We also have now a new hepatopancreas um, uh, tetrahedral virus, I think it's called HPTV, um, that is emerging again in Asia. Um, and so staying on the lookout uh, for possible pathways of introduction into the United States are always a big concern. Like with the catfish competition with imports, um, many of these companies are shipping out these smaller life stages because it's cheaper to produce uh, these animals in other countries than it is here. Testing requirements um, are also a big problem, not only in the interpretation of these diagnostic results, but the cost of these tests. There are about 13 current pathogens that many of our facilities are having to test for. We don't have, again, any validated test. We don't know what the effect of pooling is on the uh, sensitivity of these diagnostic assays. Some of our trading partners are requiring that 175 animals be tested individually for PCR for eight to 13 of these viruses. That price tag at one of our domestic laboratories is around forty-five to fifty thousand dollars per 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 testing batch. Many of our facilities, because of uh, trading partner requirements, have to test not only at the farm level twice a year, but then they have to have valid test results within thirty days of those animals being exported. So the amount of investment that these companies are having to do in order to uh, meet these testing requirements is very significant. And of course, we are working with um, our industry partners, our laboratories to see if we can um, think tank ways to um, afford for pooling. Is multiplex testing or multi-test PCRs options? Um, and how do we get those options validated so that they are um, free not free, but we are um, approved to use those here uh, 
um, for health assessments in the United States. All right, and I see we have about 13 minutes left um, for questions or comments. And uh, with that, then, I turn it back to Liz um, to wrap us up for today. Also, just a reminder that next week we've got Dr. Marston, uh, who will be sharing with everybody here um, trade issues for our domestic aquaculture industries. Um, so we're really looking forward to having her uh, lead you guys in next week's discussion. Happy to take questions now, Liz. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, should I go ahead, Liz? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, to ask written questions, please be sure to select all panelists in the drop-down menu in the WebEx chat panel, type a new message in the message box provided, and press enter on your keyboard. Thank you. All right. So we do have the first question. I think um, we'll go to Lauren. Does the depth of the cup affect the taste of the oyster or just creates a meteor oyster, which is preferred? And do you worry about non-naive species of shellfish being released in waterways by production systems? Okay, so for the first part of the question, um, the depth of the cup doesn't necessarily affect the taste. It just produces a meatier product. What affects the taste largely are the waters in which they're grown. So when you talk to folks about oysters and their taste, you know, it's almost like describing wine. They'll, they'll say, you know, well, these oysters have kind of like a melon flavor, and they'll use kind of the same lingo that we use in wine or, you know, fancy like Belgian beers, for example. So that's largely site-specific and regional. We're known for having really kind of um, salty oysters on in New England. And the Pacific oysters are a little more mild in general. Um, but the second question was about introducing non-native species. I'm sorry, can you repeat that second part, Liz? Sure. Do you worry about non-native species of shellfish being released in waterways by production systems? So we do worry about non-native species being released. Um, most of the species farmed on the West Coast, for example, are considered invasive species and you're not allowed to farm them in our region. So that is a, a big concern right up there with, you know, shucking waste. Um, certainly you can't get permitted to try to farm those species, but people can release them in the waterways. Um, you can overnight oysters and shellfish around the country, even around the world in some cases. So um, it is a concern. Another one to add to that long list of concerns. Okay, do we have any other questions? We do not have any questions, further questions in the queue at this time, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, please, uh, if you wish to ask a written question, please be sure to select all panelists in the drop-down menu before you type in your question and then press enter on your keyboard. It looks like I did get something here, but it came to me privately. I am going to put this out there for all panelists. Okay. There is a great need. There is a great need to better understand bivalve pathogen presence throughout the Gulf and Atlantic coast. Can you discuss current state of research information attempting to better define where OIE pathogens are endemic already? So a lot of, um, I can tell you that there's a, a project in place right now with Rutgers University and they are piloting a program, a database, where all of the East Coast and Gulf Coast states are welcome to publish surveillance data for bivalves. And that eventually will be publicly available. Um, that information is really helpful when making interstate decision, you know, movement decisions. So it's in the pipeline and you're absolutely right. Um, it's really, it can be difficult to get your hands on that information. So I guess I'll say stay tuned and 
hopefully when we have that database up and running um, and publicly available, we can maybe send a link, uh, a notice out to, um, you know, the aquaculture liaison. Um, I think it'll probably be blasted out through those um, shellfish grower association web uh, groups that I talked about as well. Okay. Do we have any other additional questions? I do not see any further questions in the queue at this time. So we have a comment, very good information. Are the presentations being recorded for review? And yes, they are. And they will be um, uploaded into the National Training Exercise Program um, website and we will send out a list of when they will be there and they will be under a tab that is under aquaculture. Here's another question. Where do we find interstate reportable and monitor diseases for aquaculture? Hey, Nicole, it's oh. Kathleen. Oh, go ahead, Lauren. No. So uh, there are a couple of websites available, and I'm happy to send those uh, through Liz and Stacy to send out to you guys where to look up that information about what the what uh, different states might require for movement. Um, we do, of course, have the NLRAD list um, that has all of the mollusk and crustacean pathogens. Right now, those lists completely mirror the OIE listed diseases. Um, there is some, you know, as we think about a process or an algorithm on what pathogens should be listed as part of the NLRAD, uh, we're still working on that. Uh, right now, for interstate movement, many states don't have any requirements uh, for shellfish uh, movement around this country. I would think, and, you know, uh, Lauren can confirm or deny. I think the East Coast uh, is probably a little bit farther ahead than the West Coast in terms of states having particular requirements. Since there is so much um, seed uh, being moved up and down the state there, but uh, I would definitely look to the NLRAD uh, list, which is going to be for obviously all states. Uh, and then we can send a link out where you can look at uh, the requirements for the different uh, states there. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please be sure to select all panelists in the drop-down menu in WebEx chat before you type in your question and then press enter on your keyboard. Thank you. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Um, I will say if any other questions come in in the next couple of minutes, we will certainly get them to Kathleen and um, Lauren for your answers. Um, I would also like to thank Dr. Hartman and Dr. Harris for their presentations today. And as Kathleen reminded you, please make sure to mark your calendars for our third webinar in this series on October 1st at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time, where Dr. Alicia Markson will be talking about international movement. So, and with that, I will wish you a best afternoon. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Services. You may now disconnect.